Hi, welcome once more on my scientific channel Discover Social Sciences. I am presenting the second educational video in the path entitled Fundamentals of Management. These videos are addressed specifically uh, to my students in the majors of international relations and in the major of film and TV production, although, of course, everyone who watches it can benefit, I hope, every student or every person who is just interested in management science uh, can approach creatively uh, that thing. And today I am introducing one specific topic pertinent to the course of management, and this is team building. You can see it in the in the window of my PowerPoint presentation, uh, the window which I have just uh, made bigger a little bit to make it more readable, so we go into team building. First of all, I will allow myself a little quote from uh, one of like classics so to say, in the term, uh, in the field of management. And that classic is uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, who wrote uh, that book, The Prince, uh, published in 1532. Okay, here is the quote, and I explain why I consider this quote pertinent to the general topic of team building. The cities of Germany are absolutely free. They own but little country around them and they yield obedience to the emperor when it suits them. Nor do they fear this or any other power they may have near them because they are fortified in such a way that everyone thinks the taking of them by assault would be tedious and difficult, seeing they have proper ditches and walls, they have sufficient artillery and they always keep in public depots enough for one year's eating, drinking and firing. And beyond this, to keep the people quiet and without loss to the state, they always have the means of giving work to the community in those labors that are the life and strength of the city and on the pursuit of which the people are supported. They also hold military exercises in repute and moreover have many ordinances to uphold them. Why do I quote this specific passage from Machiavelli? Because that short description of German cities corresponds, at least in my mind, to what a well-managed and well-built team should be in an organization. The team should be able to learn and sort of become better and better hold the military exercises in repute, that team should be sort of strong, should be able to introduce and make a difference uh, without having constantly to rely on organization or organizations around it. Uh, so that presentation or, the, or those thoughts from Niccolo Machiavelli about German cities for me, they, they perfectly match the description of what a good team should be. Strong, dynamic, able to change, able to sustain itself and constantly learning something new. Okay, so what, is, uh, what are the foundations of making a successful team? Here I invite you to go, uh, maybe to go back to the video entitled uh, Fundamentals of Management number one and uh, to the role of emotions in management. Making a successful team means connecting people, connections between people, emotions, goals and values. So making a successful team can be compared to making a race car. You need a lot of components. Each of those components has to work smoothly and they need to work smoothly together. And uh, in that visualization, in the visual I have in the slide, I put that big picture of a, like a stylized brain that people converge towards. This is very much what a good team should be. It should be a collective intelligence, a group of people who can achieve and make a difference and in the same time be collectively intelligent and learn. 
Now, the question of em emotions. Uh, maybe it is not quite politically correct, yet it is important to understand. And this is why, indirectly, why I made that reference to Machiavelli. You need to engage emotions in people. A team leader is like a coach of a football team. You don't just need intellect, you need emotions. You need people to put their personal resources for the team. So management is largely an art of manipulation. Manipulation understood positively as an art and the craft of stimulating emotions in other people. And here we, it is important to remember, we are collectively intelligent creatures. At the end of the day, we get excited about important things. So if you want to trigger emotions in people, constructive emotions, you need to give them constructive values and goals. I will pass to that in a moment. A good team needs to have values which go over and beyond immediate rewards. This is the distinction between goals and values, which I will pursue in a, a few slides further. Now, the question of picking the team, of, of selecting people for the team. There is a, that phenomenon that people who are on the team reflect somehow uh, the personality of the team leader who selects the team. So who do I pick for my team depends on the way I, uh, on the way I pick people for my team. So the final composition of the team depends on my personal criteria as a team leader when I uh, compose the team, when I select it. For example, I gave here that question, do you want cheerleaders or do you want warriors? That question, cheerleaders or warriors, is important. Do you want or do I want as a team leader to have a team of people who generally comply with my directives, who obey, or do I want people who have like really strong personalities and who are able and eager to polemize, to argue with me? Of course, the stronger the personalities, the more they can achieve. But here is the question for me as a team leader. Can I handle such strong personalities? So that general question, do I want cheerleaders or do I want warriors, translates into questions about my own capacity and my own skills as a team leader. And now, which of these am I as a leader? Am I a cheerleader for someone higher than me in the hierarchy or am I a warrior? Uh, and the team I, I build as a leader will be a reflection of me as a person. Now, there is that other thing that you can read in the heading of the slide, that teams interact with hierarchies inside and outside. Uh, this is an important thing to understand. In a moment, I will magnify the slide for you to be able to read the text a little bit better. So the general question is that uh, in the reality of management, in a typical team management or project management. The team uh, is usually some, uh, somehow anchored and placed inside a bigger organization and interacts with the hierarchies outside and, in this, uh, uh, and on another plan there will be a hierarchy forming inside the team. Whenever, whether I want it or not, as a team leader, those people on the team will make an informal hierarchy between them. Okay, so now I will make that text a little bit bigger and go quickly through those points. So there is a hierarchy inside the team and the team interacts with external hierarchies. So this is what I have just introduced. Every team builds spontaneously hierarchy among its members. Managing a team means managing that process of hierarchy forming. It is very important to understand and to know. And this is quite fresh science because until recently, until like 2010, uh, let's say, 
there was that almost axiomatic claim that teams are composed of equal members, that teams inside operate at a foot of equality. Neurophysiology, neuroscience proves that it is wrong. We humans are deeply inherently hierarchical and teams create hierarchies spontaneously, even subconsciously, among the team members. Those people, even subconsciously, will compete against each other. And the good team leader should fully acknowledge that phenomenon and utilize it to the best of the team. Your team has to interact with external hierarchies. It's important to steer that process purposefully. Now, a little step back to the previous slide about that distinction between cheerleaders and warriors. If you have a team made of cheerleaders, it is much easier to make them interact with an external hierarchy. But if you happen to have warriors on the team, that's tougher. Make uh, strong personalities uh, who form a team. Make them interact constructively and smoothly with an external hierarchy can be tough. Those people don't necessarily want to fit into such an external hierarchical structure. And a return or a closure on what I already announced. So recent research in neurophysiology suggests that the sentiment of equality in social interactions is a social contrivance. So it is just a sentiment that serves to attenuate conflicts. Underneath, we are chimps with smartphones. We are essentially hierarchical in our social relations. Team in a project is different from teams in permanent organizations. This is another thing. In practice, in real life, you might be a team leader or a team participant in two different contexts. Either it is a project or it is a permanent organization. Uh, and uh, those two types of teams are different because goals are different. In a team uh, oriented on finite goals, so in a project team, uh, we have like a well-defined checkpoint in time. We have finite goals and finite goals are different from permanent values. So people on the team on a project team are focused or should be focused on achieving a specific outcome on a specific moment in time. So in a project you need people strongly oriented on results and people who by the same fact are somehow restless in their lifestyle. If you have a project team you can recruit guys and girls who are somehow uh, originals who are precisely those warriors with strong personalities. Whilst in a permanent organization, if you manage a team inside a permanent structure like an ad administration, uh, you need people who have a proclivity for ritual behavior, who are able to sustain the same recurrent repetitive activity for a long time, those people who can maintain continuity, hmm? uh, people who are ready to do their job all the time. In a project, people have tasks and the project, and the project team has its work divided into micro goals. And those micro goals are instrumental to the achievement of a general goals assigned of, uh, to the team as a whole. So. Uh, in a project team, it is important to remind those team members constantly that we together are supposed to achieve that specific outcome on a specific moment in time. Whilst in a permanent organization, people have jobs rather than tasks and their division of labor needs to take into account the simple fact that the jobs they have are inherently connected with the rest of their life, of their social life. 
So the jobs they have on the team uh, have a connection with the prestige they have in their social environment, with their feeling of security and so on. Now, basic tools of team building. So the basic things that we can focus on when we are team builders or team leaders. I named four, maybe you can find more, but I named uh, four which seem the most important to me. They are, and those four basic tools are recruitment, reference to values greater than, in, uh, than immediate rewards, assessment of performance, and finally, the setting and communication of goals. I will briefly go through those main points to show you what is it about. Okay, in that slide, it will be more comfortably if I move to this side of the screen. Yes, Vasniewski, don't get in the way of knowledge. Okay, okay so recruitment. A good method of recruitment should explicitly go through two distinct phases. So when you pick people for your team, first of all, in the first step, you create a pool of candidates in the first place. And, f and in the second step, you select the best candidates in the second phase. Why it is important to distinguish those two phases? Because they work in different ways. In phase number one, so when you, are uh, when you are creating a pool of candidates, the basic logic is the, like the minimum requirements. So you have like a profile of people who technically could be eligible uh, for being on the team and they should meet like a minimum criteria. And this is how you make a pool. And then, in a second phase, inside that pool, you essentially make a hierarchy of candidates. You rank them. You choose the best on that ranking list. So here, in, in, instead of putting in place just minimum criteria, you put in place like a scoring system, a system which allows to make a hierarchy, a competition among those candidates. Here, a common sense recommendation, make clear profiles for both candidates. So both for those pulled ones and for those final ones. So both in, in your mind and in the communication with other people, make it clear what kind of person do you want to work with. For example, ask yourself, do you need formed experts in a specific field? Or do you rather need people who have potential to learn, who are like quick, uh, keen learners without any visible specialization? And especially when you are in the second phase, so when you are ranking the pool, the candidates, make the screening process as close to real life as possible. So. Uh, score those people according to their performance in tasks or tests which reflect what they are supposed to do on the team. So, for example, if you have a team in a marketing project, you don't necessarily need to check their ethical backbone or their knowledge in history. Of course, you might, huh? but you don't have to. A better idea is to give them tasks or tests pertinent to marketing. Now, a general remark uh, as for the recruitment on a team. You might be willing to work with a set of perfect people. With a set of people who will be creative but not conflictual people who will learn quickly, but not faster than you. Life is brutal and life is full of surprises. You will never have a perfect team. What you need is a functional team. A team is like a race car, as I told you. Once you have built it, it requires some art and some craft 
to drive the car in the same manner. A good team is a, is a team that you, as a team leader, can effectively lead and manage. You don't look for perfection in your candidates. You just look for aptitude to perform the tasks they are supposed to perform. Now the question of values and goals, and with that question I find it useful to move to back to that and of the video screen and I will make maybe that text part a little bit bigger to make it nicely readable okay uh, just a little yes okay we are here so the distinction between values and goals values are outcomes that we pursue constantly all the time for example if I say that financial independence is my goal or value i would rather say that financial independence for a person who cherishes that specific outcome is a value rather than a goal because a goal is a state of things which are like, which is like finite in time we can make like the snapshot of a goal and once the goal is achieved it doesn't really matter anymore and this is different from values. If I want financial independence, financial independence is something that I want to last, to be in my life once I have achieved it for the first time. So in this respect, uh, financial independence is rather a value than a goal. So values are permanent, whilst the goals are finite in time. Values are states that we wish to maintain, whilst goals are states which we see as transitional and instrumental to other states. And those other states can, of course, be permanent values or further goals, or states in instrumental to even further states. Goals can form hierarchies. Values may be a little bit less. Huh? Of course, uh, there is that... Uh, there is that expression that someone has a hierarchy of values, but to my knowledge, especially as far as I know the recent neuro uh, neuroscience as for the perception of values in humans, either something is a value for us or it isn't. Huh? Mm, a hierarchy of values is rather an intellectual construct uh, than like a real frame of mind that you have in any individual person. We can say that values are rules which we play by. So values give general like plans of action. Goals are prizes we play for. And it is important to make the distinction between values and goals inside and outside the teams. For example, if we wrongly take something that is de facto a goal, so a finite outcome, and present it to the team as a value, well, once we reach the goal, it is going to fade. So we will have a value that essentially disappears, and this is not good. On the other hand, if we take something that is really a value, so like a permanent state we want to stay in once we achieve it, if we present it as a goal, there will not be really a precise checkpoint to test if we have achieved and reached uh, that goal, and this is not good either. Now, assessment of performance. Let me see how I fit into that window. Perfect. Okay. Assessment of performance. Here I introduce a concept, which is a formal one, which you can see in many management books. Key performance indicators or KPIs. I will even make that bigger. Key performance indicators. KPIs. I mention them because KPIs are one thing that you are sure and certain to encounter when you go into the corporate environment. 
So you are bound to see that both you are being evaluated and other people are being evaluated according to the KPIs specific to the job you have. So when applied to a team, uh, KPIs work as follows. People in the team or on the team will rival with each other anyway, as I said a few slides ago. So we are teams with smartphones and we have that spontaneous proclivity to compete against each other and to form hierarchies. That competition will and that rivalry will take place inside the team more or less subtly and more or less openly. A good leader civilizes that rivalry and uses it as a tool for optimizing collective performance. So when you assess people's performance on the team, keep that in mind that your assessment of performance should be connected or is bound to be connected to a set of rewards, material or emotional, that you give those people for their work. And whence the necessity or the need to establish those KPIs, so the key performance in indicators, and use them consistently. With some exceptions, management with clear KPIs openly communicated to the team is more efficient than using hidden criteria. Still, sometimes the latter case works. Huh? Um, it is applied in some specific context, for example, in law enforcement, but rarely. Usually, for the most cases, you can adopt that working principle, that key performance indicators, so the assessment of performance works when you clearly communicate the way you assess the members of your team. And finally, that last thing, setting and communication of goals. So a few truths which develop on that distinction between values and goals, which I went through a few slides ago. Maybe I will make it slightly bigger. Okay. Yes, can you see? Can you see? So goals work when people know they go for those goals. Huh? Com communicate clearly the goals that people are supposed to achieve. I know that as I quoted Machiavelli uh, in the beginning of that presentation, you might be tempted to see yourself as a team leader who has like a whole range of hidden goals. And you'd like, and you're like a puppet master manipulating those people on the team. It doesn't really work this way. When you communicate clearly what we are all uh, trying to achieve, people tend to align their work on that common goal, huh? even even if they are not quite aware of that alignment. Now, goals and assessment of performance should be connected to each other. So I was talking about those key performance indicators. Make those KPIs in line with the final goal or goals that the team is supposed to achieve. Once again, if you want a team, for example, to launch successfully a new technology, you don't necessarily assess people, for example, uh, on the number of hours spent in office but rather on the actual results they have as a team. Key performance indicators work better when people understand how they translate into final outcomes that the whole team attempts to achieve. And the goals work when they are in line with values cherished in the team or, or by the team. I return once again to that distinction between values and goals. It is important at this point to understand that if you have a, a team already built, those, peoples, uh, those people have a certain set of values which they pursue consciously or subconsciously. With the given set of values, there are goals that they can productively go for together and there are goals which they cannot really pursue collectively because when goals are in conflict with values, 
goals have to yield to values. This is an important principle. I know that uh, at this point you might have doubts. Is everybody ethical? So is everybody so attached to values? In a sense, yes. Everyone has values in the sense that every one of us has inside the brain here, between the ears, some kind of cognitive logical structure which makes us go through still another day from morning to evening. Each of us has values because each of us has things that are important to us. Unless you are schizophrenic, you have emotions. When you have emotions, you attach importance to something. And things that are important to you are the basis of the values you pursue, whether you are conscious and aware of that or not. Okay, that would be all in that educational video about team building. Once again, it is the second video in the educational path devoted to fundamentals of management. As usually, I wish you to have fun with science and to have fun with life. And I encourage you to visit my blog at discoversocialsciences.com. Bye.